Do you ever sit down, read a couple pages of a book, and then realize that none of it sunk in? Well, I can definitely relate. Let's listen to Dr. Andrew Huberman as he teaches us the best strategy to actually learn that no school will teach you. Dr. Huberman's work will help you unlock your brain's full learning potential and learn to process information in a way that it will actually stick. People are so familiar with sitting down, reading a couple pages of a book, and realizing that none of it sunk in. This can be very damaging for school, work performance, and relationships, as many of you know. We're going to discuss mechanism and scientific data and the tools that those mechanisms and scientific data point to so that you can tailor your practices around learning to your specific needs and goals. You might want to learn how to dance and get better at remembering and learning languages, for instance, or at unlearning some difficult emotional experience. What we're talking about today is using behavior as a gate to enter states of mind and body that allow you to access plasticity. Neuroplasticity is arguably one of the most important aspects of our biology. It holds the promise for each and all of us to think differently, to learn new things, to forget painful experiences, and to essentially adapt to anything that life brings us by becoming better. All of us were born with a nervous system that isn't just capable of change, but was designed to change. When we enter the world, our nervous system is primed for learning. What this tells us is that the young brain is a plasticity machine. But then right about age 25, plus or minus a year or two, everything changes. After age 25 or so, in order to get changes in our nervous system, we have to engage in a completely different set of processes in order to get those changes to occur and for them, more importantly, to stick around. The stinger is when you're young, your brain is very plastic, but you have less control over your experience. When you're older, generally, you have more control over your experience, but your brain is less plastic. So if you're already asking the question as a 20-year-old or a 15-year-old, what can I do now that's really going to enhance my brain? Uh, I guess the simple question would uh, answer, excuse me, would be an aside, which would be get the broadest education you can possible. That means uh, math, chemistry, physics, literature, music, learn how to play an instrument, get a broad training in a number of things and find the thing that really uh, captures your passion and excitement and then put a ton of additional effort there. Knowing how to tap into these plasticity mechanisms is very powerful. You need these chemicals deployed in the nervous system in order to mark whatever nerve cells happen to be firing in the time afterward for change. And people are obsessed with asking, you know, what supplements, what drugs, what conditions, what machines will allow for that. We learned to take our different maps of, ex of experience, our motor maps, our auditory maps, our visual maps, and to link them, we align those maps, our maps of visual space and our maps of auditory space and our maps of motor space are aligned to one another in perfect register. And this is what allows us to move through space and function in our lives in a really fluid way. If you are uncomfortable making errors and you get frustrated easily, if you leverage that frustration toward drilling deeper into the endeavor, you are setting yourself up for a terrific set of plasticity mechanisms to engage. But if you take that frustration and you walk away from the endeavor, you are essentially setting up plasticity to rewire you according to what happens afterwards, which is generally feeling pretty miserable. So now you can kind of start to appreciate why it is that continuing to drill into a process to the point of frustration, but then staying with that process for a little bit longer is the most important thing for adult learning. Incremental learning as an adult is absolutely essential. You are not going to get massive shifts in your representations of the outside world. So how do you make small errors as opposed to big errors? Well, the key is smaller bouts of focused learning for smaller bits of information. It's a mistake to try and learn a lot of information in one learning bout as an adult. What these papers from the Knudsen lab show is that the adult nervous system is fully capable of engaging in a huge amount of plasticity, but you need to do it in smaller increments per learning epoch or per learning episode. So how would you do this? Well, let's say, uh, for instance, I'm terrible at free throws. So let's say I wanted to learn free throws. I'm going to make errors. I'm going to make a lot of errors. If I go into learning free throws, knowing that errors are the gate to plasticity, well, then I feel a little bit better, but I still have to aim for the 
the rim of the basket. How long should I go? Well, until I'm hitting the point of frustration. And at that point, continuing probably for anywhere from 10 to 100 more trials should be my limit. The beauty of motor learning is that the circuits for auditory and visual and motor more or less teach themselves. I don't necessarily have to be paying attention to, you know, exactly what, um, you know, the contact of my fingers with the ball or some random feature like whether or not I'm bending my knees or not. The key is to try a number of different parameters until I start to approximate the behavior that I want to get a little bit better and then trying to get consistent about that. Now, many of you involved in sports learning will say, okay, well, that's obvious is just incremental learning. But the key thing is in those errors. By isolating the errors and making a a number of errors in a particular aspect of the motor movement, it signals to the brain that it's plastic. And if I leave that episode of going and trying to learn how to shoot free throws, my brain is still plastic. Plasticity is a state of the brain and nervous system. You're trying your best to accomplish something and you're failing. You're you're absolutely failing. You're you're trying to remember, say, um, the sign language alphabet. Um, I was trying to teach myself this recently and then I kept repeating and repeating and then to get to a certain point where I kept making errors, making errors, making errors. You want to keep making errors for this period of time that I'm saying will last anywhere for about seven to 30 minutes. It is exceedingly frustrating, but that frustration, it liberates the chemical cues that signal that plasticity needs to happen and they also signal the particular neurons that are active, it essentially highlights that pathway for change. When we come back a day or two later in a learning bout after a nap or a night or two of deep rest, then what we find is that we can remember certain things and the motor pathways work. Learn to attach dopamine in a subjective way to this process of making errors. Making failures, failing repetitively, provided we're engaged in a very specific set of behaviors when we do it, as well as telling ourselves that those failures are good for learning and good for us, creates an outsized effect on the rate of plasticity. When you naturally have the highest mental acuity, and that's really when you want to engage in these learning bouts. And then get to the point where you're making errors and then keep making errors for 7 to 30 minutes. But then here's the beauty of it. You also have created the optimal milieu for learning other things afterward. If you leave that bout of, I give the example of free throws, or maybe it's playing tennis, or maybe it's some other skill, and you sit down to read a book, your brain is in a heightened state to learn and retain the information. Because those chemicals don't get released and then shut down, you're creating a whole milieu and environment of these chemicals. Somewhere in Hollywood, presumably, it got embedded in somebody's mind that instant skill acquisition was possible that you could take a particular pill or you could touch a particular object or you could have a wand wave over you and you would suddenly have a skill. It doesn't exist, at least not in reality. So anytime we learn something, we have to decide what to place our sensory perception on, meaning what are we going to focus on? You can decide to learn how to do a golf swing or learn how to shoot free throws or learn how to dance tango and decide that you are going to focus on the movements of your partner or the positions of your feet. There are some beautiful experiments that point to the fact that by simple adjustment of what you are focused on as you attempt to learn a new skill, you can adjust the number of repetitions that you do, you adjust your motivation for learning, and you can vastly accelerate learning. Some of you may recognize this by its internet name, which is not a scientific term, which is the Super Mario effect. Basically what they did was they had 50,000 subjects, which is a enormous number of subjects, learn a program, essentially taking words from a computer program or the commands for a computer program that were kind of clustered in a column on the right. But the job of the subjects in these experiments were to organize those instructions in a particular way that would allow a little cursor to move through the maze successfully. So people started doing this. Now, there were two groups and some one half of the subjects, if they got it wrong, meaning they entered a command and the cursor would move and it was the wrong command for this little cursor to move through the maze. They saw a signal jump up on their screen that said, that did not work, please try again. The other half of the subjects, if they got something wrong, were told, you just lost five points, please continue. That's the only difference in the feedback that they got. If they looked at the success rate of the subjects, what they found was 
that the subjects that were told that did not work, please try again, had a 68% success rate. Whereas the ones that were told you lost five points had a 52% success rate, which is a significant difference. The subjects that were told that did not work, please try again, tried many, many more times per unit time. Whereas the people that were told you lost five points gave up earlier or gave up entirely. So let's just step back from this because to me, this was very surprising. The experiment that I want to tell you about is called the tube test. You take two rats, you put them in a tube or two mice, you put them in a tube and mice and rats, they don't like to share the same tube. So what they'll do is they'll start pushing each other back and forth, back and forth. Sooner or later, one of the rats or mice pushes the other one out. The one that got pushed out is the loser. The one that gets the tube is the winner. Now you take the winner, you give it a new competitor. And what you find is that the mouse or rat that won previously has a much higher than chance probability of winning the second time. In other words, winning before leads to winning again. And the reverse is also true. If you take the loser and you put that loser in with another mouse, fresh mouse, new mouse, the loser typically will lose at much greater probability than chance. And this is not related to differences in strength or size or testosterone or any other of the things that might leap to mind as explanations for this, because those were all controlled for. Now, that result had been known about for decades, but three years ago, there was a paper published in the journal Science that examined the brain area that's involved in this. Turns out it's a particular area of the frontal cortex. And they did a simple experiment where they, the experimenters increased or decreased the activity of this brain area in the prefrontal cortex. And what they found is if they stimulated this brain area, a mouse or rat, regardless of whether or not it had been a winner or loser before, became a winner every single time. And they showed that if they blocked the activity of this brain area, regardless of whether or not the mouse or rat had been a winner or a loser, it became a loser every single time. So what is this magic brain area? What is it doing? Well, the reason I'm bringing this up today and the reason I'm bringing it up on the heels of the Super Mario effect is that stimulation of this brain area had a very simple and very important effect, which was it led to more forward steps, more repetitions, more effort, but not in terms of sheer might and will, not digging deeper, just more repetitions per unit time. The Super Mario effect, this online experiment, and the tube test, which has been done by various labs and repeated again and again, point to a simple but very important rule. The neurobiological explanation for learning a skill is you want to perform as many repetitions per unit time as you possibly can at least when you're first trying to learn a skill. You know, people are so familiar with sitting down, reading a couple pages of a book and realizing that none of it sunk in. Or talking to someone and seeing their mouth move, maybe even nodding your head subconsciously and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and none of it sinks in. This can be very damaging for school, work performance, and relationships, as many of you know. The best way to get better at focusing is to use the mechanisms of focus that you were born with. And the key principle here is that mental focus follows visual focus. We are all familiar with the fact that our visual system can be unfocused, blurry, or jumping around, or we can be very laser focused on one location in space. What's interesting and vitally important to understanding how to access neuroplasticity is that you can use your visual focus and you can increase your visual focus as a way of increasing your mental fo focus abilities more broadly. When we focus on something visually, we have two options. We can either look at a very small region of space with a lot of detail and a lot of precision, or we can dilate our gaze and we can see big pieces of visual space with very little detail. It's a trade-off. We can't look at everything at high resolution. The key is to learn how to focus better visually if you want to bring about higher levels of cognitive or mental focus, even if you're engaged in a physical task. Now, there's a remarkable phenomenon in animals where animals that have their eyes on the side of their head are scanning the entire visual environment all the time. They're not focused on anything. Think you're grazing animals, your cows, your sheep, your birds, etc. But think about a bird picking up seeds on the beach or on concrete. Its eyes are on the side of its head and yet it has this tiny beak that can quickly pick up these little seeds off the ground with immense precision. Now, if you try to do that, 
by staring off to the sides of the room and picking up items in front of you with high precision at that tiny scale, little tiny objects, you will miss almost every time. And it turns out as they lower their head, their eyes very briefly move inward in what's called a virgin's eye movement. Their eyes can't actually translocate in their head. They're fixed in the skull, just like yours and mine are. But when we move our eyes slightly inward, two things happen. Not only do we develop a smaller visual window into the world, but we activate a set of neurons in our brainstem that trigger the release of both norepinephrine, epinephrine, and acetylcholine. Norepinephrine is kind of similar to epinephrine. So in other words, when our eyes are relaxed in our head, when we're just kind of looking at our entire visual environment, moving our head around, moving through space, we're in optic flow, things moving past us, or we're sitting still, we're looking broadly at our space, we're relaxed. When our eyes move slightly inward toward a particular visual target, our visual world shrinks, our level of visual focus goes up, and we know that this relates to the release of acetylcholine and epinephrine at the relevant sites in the brain for plasticity. Now, what this means is that if you have a hard time focusing your mind for sake of reading or for listening, you need to practice, and you can practice, focusing your visual system. Now, this works best if you practice focusing your visual system at the precise distance from the work that you intend to do for sake of plasticity. You can get incredible plasticity of positive experiences of things that you want by engaging this high focus regime and then rest, non-sleep, deep rest and sleep.